Got the black kit on again. You know what that means? More Snyder shore rifle. Today, we're gonna give the Mark II Snyder shore rifle a bit of a workout. We'll start at 100 yards and work our way back to 500. If the conditions hold. Well, suffice it to say, they didn't. We were interrupted by a little bit of monsoon, shall we say. That said, I did get some decent shooting in before we had to pack up and pick up later at a different location. For me, one of the pleasures of shooting these old rifles is shooting them at ranges greater than 100 yards. This is especially so when shooting at steel. The delay in hearing the report of a bullet hit a gong never fails to bring a grin. Of course, in order to achieve this, you have to put the time in and find your sight settings. That's what this video is all about. Now you might be wondering why we simply can't set the sights and expect our rounds to hit at that given range. The reason is this. When working up your rifle, the load that you arrive at is not necessarily equal to the service load of the day. As I always opt for the most accurate load, the differences in velocity as compared to that of the service load are sometimes great. And although, as a result of this, the rifle shoots well at 100 yards, this basically throws off all sight settings greater than 100 yards. <laughs> Hence, the need to something. practice and determine what these sight settings should be with your given load at these longer ranges. As with any range practice, there's always some preliminaries that need to be attended to. It's always a good idea to blacken both your front sight and your back sight. This ensures that your sight picture is good and crisp. As well, you must remove the oil from your bore. Black powder fouling and petroleum products typically don't go together. The ammunition used in these practices is my standard loading for my short rifle. The X-Ring Services .600 Snyder Bullet 24 gauge shotgun brass loaded with 62.5 grains of 3F powder and cornmeal filling. They're packaged in packets of 10 rounds held in the main pouch. These are emptied as required, 10 rounds at a time, into the expense pouch carried on the front of the waist belt. Now the purpose of this practice is to stretch the range a bit and see what my sight settings need to be in order to hit targets greater than 100 yards away. Now I've done enough work up with this rifle to be comfortable at 100 yards. Well here we go. That's what a zeroed group looks like. The rifle will easily knock down the plates at 100 yards. Given that, I've shot the rifle at 150 yards last summer in Alberta. The results in our friendly competition were certainly promising. And without any sort of intermediate workup, I did manage to score a couple of hits at 700 yards. So it's those intermediate ranges that this practice is going to help me with. That hits something. When using our sights, we have three tools at our disposal. The first, and most obvious, is the setting we've set our sights to. The sights on these Victorian arms are commonly graduated in 100 yard increments. The second is the sight picture we take up, using the front sight and the back sight together. In this, there are three variations. The first is known as the full sight. Here, the top of the front sight is placed in line with the top of the back sight. This will result in the highest MPI, or main point of impact. The next is known as the half sight. Here, the front sight is placed halfway down the notch of the back sight. This will result in an intermediate MPI. The final variation is known as the fine sight. Here, the front sight is placed at the very bottom of the back sight notch. And as you might have guessed, this will result in the lowest MPI. The third aspect is where we place that sight picture in relation to the target. Again, with this, there are generally three variations. The first is known as a six o'clock hold. Here, the front sight is placed at the bottom edge of the target. The next could be termed the center of mass hold, or bullseye hold. Here, the front sight is placed in the center of the target. The third variation could be termed the 12 o'clock hold. Here, the front sight is placed at the top edge of the target. These three aspects can be used together. Say, for instance, in this example, we'll take that the sight was set to 300 yards, 
using a fine sight held at the six o'clock position. So the intent here is to establish what sight picture I need to use at a given range, but not before a little bit of 100 yard warm up. For this, I'm using the old standby, our Pritchett International target, which is a two thirds scale model of the historical target used with this rifle from ranges of 150 to 300 yards. I've zeroed this rifle so that I use a full sight at the six o'clock position. As this was simply a warm up shoot, I elected to shoot from the standing position, as much for practice as anything else. I found that the rifle has acceptable accuracy up to about 10 rounds at a time. So the added steps of cleaning between rounds or at some other interval is not necessarily required. That said, at the 10 round interval, I typically give the bore a swap. With the grouping complete, it was time to move forward and check the results. Well, apart from the obvious, uh, oops, it seems to be pretty much zeroed, as I thought. Every time I've shot this, uh, since I adjusted the sights, it's been pretty much uh, bang on. Uh, standing group, eight inches or so. I'm pretty happy with that. I'm gonna move back to 200 now and try and ring that gong. With the confirmation complete, back to the 200 I went. To start with, I set the sights at 200 yards. And like the 100 yard practice, I used a six o'clock hold with a full sight. It took a couple of rounds to get on target and I ended up having to use the center of mass hold with a full sight to get the rounds to hit the gong. Once this adjustment was made, the gong rang regularly after that. So, satisfied with the 200 yard practice, I moved back to start to 300. Again, I started with a sight setting that mimicked the range, 300 yards. This was my first round. As you can hear, it rang the gong right off the bat. As you can see in this slow motion, it was a ricochet that rang the gong. This false positive result gave me fits for the next few rounds, thinking that I was on but not hitting the target. As you can see, the rounds were all low, some more than others. So I raised the sights to 400 yards, combining this with a full sight at a six o'clock hold. This proved to be slightly high. So I lowered the point of impact by adopting a fine sight at a six o'clock hold. This had the intended result. Due to the lighting, I found it interesting that the camera picked up the swirl of the bullet as it traveled through the air. Seen here again is the distorted arc of swirl moving towards the target. Just as I thought I was getting ahead and getting a good grip on shooting at 300 yards, the weather took a drastic change for the worse. So I packed up, resigned to the fact I'd have to pick up where I left off at a different location at a different time. So here we are at the old standby position. We had to change things up a little bit. We had some technical difficulties at the other location. So we'll carry on shooting today from the 200 and then the 300. As you can see, the conditions are pretty much perfect today. Very little wind, lots of sunshine. Let's hope that bodes well for my shooting. I elected to shoot a 200 yard practice again, just to make sure everything was as expected. The targetry was the same, the 18 inch gong and the 20 by 40. There also was no change to the ammunition I used. As for sight picture, I started where I had left off in the previous practice, set to 200 yards using a full sight at a center of mass hold. In a classic example of the black powder guards not cooperating, 
the rounds all were slightly low. So I bumped up the range from two to three hundred yards and combined this with the sight picture that would result in the lowest point of impact, a fine sight at the six o'clock hold. As is evidenced by all the gong hits, this sight picture on this day seemed to be the one to pick. So I was back on track at the 200 yard point. Satisfied, I thought it time to move back to the three. It's times like this when I do appreciate the method I've chosen to carry all my equipment around. The combination of the knapsack, haversack, and aiming rest all combine to form an easily portable shooting package. It's a one-man load and leaves your hands free. It's important to note that although I was happy with the performance of the rifle at the 200 yard point, the fact that I had to adjust my point of aim over that which I used in the previous 200 yard practice was a little bit offsetting. I used the same firing point as that which I used for the P53 P61 shoot off video. It happens to have a natural berm to rest the rifle on. So it's the mat that's generally all I need here. Well that, and a little bit of brush clearing thanks to the P60 bayonet. Because of the slight anomaly that I had experienced at 200 yards, I wanted to start the 300 yard practice with a known entity, that is to say, a low hit at the 300 yard sight setting. It didn't disappoint, and the hits were in fact low. So I bumped the range up to 400 yards, and combined this with the sight picture I had used previously, a fine sight and a 6 o'clock hold. This seemed to do the trick, but as with any confirmatory range practice, it's not a question of hitting the target once or twice, it's a question of hitting it repeatedly. Nothing, of course, ever goes 100% in your favor. In this case, I had a flyer. Try and repeat that, will ya? Seeing as how I had carried the 20 by 40 inch gong up the hill, I thought that I had better make use of it. I'm glad I did, because the lighting was perfect and I caught the bullet in flight. That's it, flying just above the red arrow. Then, on the close-up, you can see it in its final moments before it hits the target. There it is. Not a bad hit. Center of mass, slightly left. And of course accompanied by the most satisfying sound in black powder shooting. Here's another. There it is in the close-up, coming down and hitting slightly above the last one. Wait for it, wait for it. Just one more for good measure. So overall, I was quite pleased with both range practices in both locations. I think that I now have a good grip on the sight settings I need to use for those various ranges. This is of course notwithstanding that minor differences in weather and the difference in elevation between the firer and the target all contribute 
to necessitating slight differences in your point of aim. That's why it's so important for any serious shooting you do to always shoot some sighters and make sure that you've got a good grip on where your bullets are going to land. Just a small point to remember that all the components used for making the ammunition used in this video are available at X-Ring Services. Martin will take no time at all to set you up and get your Snyder shooting to its potential. I'd also like to thank Stan. He's the proprietor of the Regimental Quartermaster. Some of you may know him. He deals in all manner of Victorian kit. He graciously provided me with the greyback shirt worn in this video. It was the standard shirt worn under the tunic or frock from the mid to late Victorian era. It fits well and the quality is excellent. If you're in need of kit like this, contact him through his website. The link is in the description below.